the guy who has framed the debate for intelligent design folks. I don't think there really is a theory of intelligent design at the present time to propose as a comparable alternative to the Darwinian theory. And he says, whatever errors evolution has, it's fully worked out. There is no intelligent design theory that's comparable. Our scientific people are convinced they can do it, but that's for them to prove. And then what he says, and remember this in Texas when you have arguments about this, Johnson says no product is ready for competition in the educational world. That's an astonishing admission. But certainly if someone says there is this wonderful alternative theory that we want you to consider, the very founder of the movement admits we don't have anything ready to go into the classroom. And that's worth pointing out. Now, despite these scientific failures, intelligent design remains a public relations success story. This is a chart showing countries around the industrialized world in terms of whether they think evolution is true, that's in blue, or false, that's in red. Now, the print is fine, and you may not be able to pick out the United States on that chart, but I'm going to help you out. We are right here at the bottom of the list. The only country that we outrank in terms of acceptance of evolution is Turkey. Now, if you happen to be an intelligent design advocate, however, you might say, well, it's really not that bad, because when it turns out that we're right, we'll flip the chart upside down and we'll automatically be in second place. Um, but I don't think that's really anything to take comfort in. And this rejection of evolution manifests itself around the country in many ways. For example, just this year, for the very first time, the State Board of Education in Florida considered a radical step. And the radical step was to put the E word, evolution, into its state science standards for the very first time. To a biologist, that doesn't seem very radical. But in Florida, 12 counties passed resolutions urging the state board not to do it, not to put it in. Fortunately, they did. And this is now part of Florida's new science standards. Now, the specific example of this I want to talk about, because I and a lot of other people were so involved in it, um, it, it, it started in oh, 2004, about three or four years ago, in a small town in Pennsylvania. And that small town was called Dover. And Dover is a town of about 17, 18,000 people. And their school board one day voted to instruct the teachers in Dover to prepare a curriculum on intelligent design. And this was, you can't make this stuff up, this was the scoreboard outside Dover High School the morning after the vote. It said intelligent design won, Darwin nothing. Uh, I saw this in an article on the internet and I actually smiled when I saw it because as an old baseball player, one of the things I realized is it doesn't hurt to let the visiting team get a couple runs ahead, especially if you're going to bat in the bottom of the ninth. And I noticed they had made us the home team. So that meant that we were going to get to the bottom of the ninth. And as it turns out, we did get to bat in the bottom of the ninth. And as you'll see, we kind of ran up the score. Now, this controversy split the Dover community right down the middle. It, it, it pit citizen against citizen, pastor against pastor. It was an incredibly contentious issue in the community. What happened, however, is when the Dover board instituted this policy, of telling their students about intelligent design and buying intelligent design textbooks for the school, 11 parents in Dover decided they'd had enough. They were going to court and they filed a federal lawsuit alleging that their First Amendment rights as Americans had been abridged. Now, the First Amendment, as you know, says that the state shall make no law um, respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. They said intelligent design is religious. By promoting intelligent design, the school board in our town has, in effect, established a kind of religion. The lead plaintiff in this case is this unassuming woman in the blue blouse up here. Her name is Tammy Kitzmiller. That's K-I-T-Z Miller. And this case is known, will always be known, as Kitzmiller versus Dover. Now, what was going on here? I mean, why did the school board all of a sudden decide we want to have intelligent design? Well, it turns out they didn't do it on their own. They were following a playbook. This is the playbook. Intelligent Design and Public School Science Curricula Legal Guidebook. It is written by senior fellows of an institution in Seattle, Washington, called the Discovery Institute. And what they argued was that intelligent design could be legally taught as an alternative to creation science in classrooms. And they recommended the school boards that did this purchase copies of an intelligent design textbook published right here in Texas called Of Pandas and People. 
Remember that name because this book is going to come back in a few minutes. So what they were doing really is following this playbook um, written by members of the Discovery Institute, published by the Foundation for Thought and Ethics, which also published, of course, Pandas and People. Now the interesting thing about this, and we'll get to some of this in just a little bit, is it resulted in a highly publicized trial. Um, Salon called it the New Monkey Trial. Other people called it Scopes 2. Some people called it Scopes 3 because they thought there had been another trial in there. The trial started in September 26, 2005, and I had the honor, although I'm not sure that's the right word, of being the lead witness for the plaintiffs in the trial. And I thought this would be a pretty straightforward thing. Uh, trial started Monday morning. I'd walk into court. I'd give my testimony. I'd be cross-examined in the afternoon. This is in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. I'd fly home to Providence. Tuesday afternoon, I'd give my lecture in my cell biology class. Everything would be cool. Didn't work out that way. By the end of the day Monday, I realized I was going to be on the stand all day Tuesday. So I had to do something I had never done in 26 years of teaching at my school, which is to cancel a scheduled lecture. Told all my students about this, went there, went ahead and did this, an extraordinary experience. Now, the interesting thing about the trial is that for proponents of intelligent design, this was their chance to win and to win big time. They, were, they, they relished the idea of confronting Darwinists like me in the courtroom. And this is, in fact, the NBC TV sketch of my cross-examination in the courtroom. Those are my textbooks sort of piled up there. There's Finding Darwin's God there, guys leaning forward and making a point. And one of the reasons they were really excited was because by the luck of the draw, the judge who heard the case, John E. Jones III, um, was a very conservative judge. Judge Jones is a lifelong Republican. He was a political protege of Governor Tom Ridge, who we may remember was President Bush's first secretary of Homeland Security. You may also know that to become a federal judge, you have to be recommended by one of your state senators. The senator who recommended John Jones was Rick Santorum one of the most conservative members of the U.S. Senate, and they figure this is great. We've got the venue we want. we got the support of the school board. We're going to fly in our experts. we got a nice conservative George W. Bush appointee. We're going to win this case. Um, didn't work out that way. What actually happened in trial was simply the utter collapse of intelligent design as anything even remotely resembling a scientific theory. Now, I don't have time to go through everything, of course, that happened in the trial, but I want to give you a couple of examples because these examples are telling. One of the principal claims of the intelligent design movement is that evolution simply cannot explain the origin of complex machines within the living cell, like these nifty little flagella on the edge of, these on the edge of this bacteria. Now, why is that? Their answer is these structures have a quality called irreducible complexity, and that means evolution couldn't possibly have produced these structures. Now, the prime example of this is indeed the bacterial flagellum. Now, the bacterial flagellum is this absolutely extraordinary structure. It's an acid-powered, reversible rotary engine. About a billion years before Felix Wankel invented the rotary engine that's in Mazda cars, nature had evolved an actual rotary engine in the person of the bacterial flagellum. It's unbelievably uh, cool. It's unbelievably complex. It works well. It can spin at over 5,000 revolutions per minute. This thing is just absolutely amazing. Now, why is this, the existence of this, an argument against evolution? The person who has made this clearest is a biochemist at Lehigh University named Michael Behe. He says this system is irreducibly complex. And here's what he says that, why that's important. An irreducibly complex system cannot be produced directly by slight successive modifications of a precursor system. In other words, by evolution, because that's how evolution would work. Because any precursor to an irreducibly complex system that is missing a part is by definition non-functional. Flagellum has about 30, some species, 40 proteins in it. His argument is all those proteins have to be there before the flagellum works. So you can't evolve five or 10 parts have a little bit of function, evolve five or ten more, and so forth. And in fact, to make this clear, B, he uses a common mousetrap as an example. Now, a mousetrap has five parts. It's got a, a base plate, a catch, a spring, a hammer, and a nifty little hold-down bar. And here's what he says. A good example of an irreducibly complex system is a mousetrap. The function requires all the pieces. You can't catch a few mice with just a platform, add a spring, catch a few more, add a holding bar, etc. All the components have to be in place before any mice are caught, thus the mousetrap is irreducibly complex.